Good morning. Welcome to the seventh tea dose. And I hope you're going to have a good day today because we're full with uh, talks uh, with uh, several speakers. We have on the left side, we have a complete track around education and open source. And the rest two of the uh, lectures are about system administration. Tomorrow is a full day about development and software engineering. So I hope you to see you all again tomorrow, but have a good day today. And uh, welcome to Tito's. And I'll hand over the microphone to uh, Leonard Puttering, who's, who's going to give the first keynote for today. And uh, well, let's listen to him. Okay. Um, hi. So, um, my name is Leonard Petterling. I work for Red Hat. I'm uh, famous and, I guess, infamous for creating um, Avahi and Pulse Audio and Systemd and a couple of other things. Um, I was uh, kindly asked by Jean-Paul to do a keynote here. And um, he suggested I should talk a little bit about something vision and technology related. So, um, yeah. Um, I uh, prepared this talk called What Now? Um, usually, I'm mostly a technical guy. I'm a developer, after all. And I, I, I tend to focus on, on solving technical things and, and hacking all day. Um, now, uh, when uh, Jean-Paul asked me to talk a little bit about vision and technology, I was wondering, whoa, that's actually a good question. What is actually my vision? Why, um, why or what, what is it that I'm actually trying to achieve with what I'm doing? And uh, and, uh, or more specifically, why am I actually doing what I'm doing? And um, of course, every hacker has to ask himself that. And there are many reasons um, for most of us, I guess. Um, uh, a very important reason, of course, is um, most of us probably just like to hack. And um, so that's what we do. Um, but then again, um, people, of course, have different goals of what they hack. On. Some people um, prefer to hack on their own uh, music um, uh, software have anybody else uses that. Um, I must admit that I actually try to follow something that I, I want to get the stuff that I'm doing into the hands of people and I actually want to to, to improve um, learning from them in, in a greater way. So um, I was wondering so what's, what's actually my vision? And um, yeah I'm actually a believer in free software. So my vision for free software is absolutely that everybody uses it or at least it's available for everybody, and there are no, no hurdles um, for adoption for anybody. Um, so if that's the case, um, I don't know, um, if, if you guys know what I'm actually working on, I'm, like the biggest project that I'm currently involved with is, is Systemd, of course. Um, let me talk a little bit about what Systemd actually is. Systemd is, um, is basically um, a redesign how the, the um, most low-level user space parts of our operating system work. Um, traditionally on Linux and Unix, um, or in, on most Unixes, um, the software called System 5 init was involved in uh, booting up the system. And um, this software had been used for, for basically since um, time began in Unix, um, since 30 years unmodified basically. Um, there have been a couple of um, um, revisions of that, and, and then somebody re-implemented it and called it Upstart or something. But um, for 30 years, um, nobody actually looked at the problem in whole, tried to figure out if it's if computing is still the same um, and has not changed in those 30 years, and then did something about that. Um, so with Systemd, we we try to to go all the way and, and, and looked at all the details and all the lower level bits and, and try to figure out how do computers work these days, how did they work 30 years ago, and how do we actually need to update um, Systemd for that. Um, this, yeah, um, Systemd is nowadays um, part of um, uh, a couple of distributions, like um, all the big ones um, with the exception of Ubuntu have switched. Um, so um, regardless if you run Fedora or, or SUSE or something like that, you'll um, run um, um, Systemd. Um, and uh, the next RHEL version is going to be based on, that, on it as well, and, and, and obviously SLAS as well. Um, so um, basically, Systemd is nowadays the core of all the, the, the big um, money-making distributions in a way. Um, but yeah, again, what, what is actually the vision with, with Systemd? 
um, like like um, reworking the base of the system, changing everything around, and trying to modernize it. Uh, what am I actually trying to do to, to deal with that? And that again is actually um, my hope to make uh, Linux more interesting for the wider audience. Now the question is like, if you want to make your stuff. Uh, um, available to the wider audience, why do you start with one of the most low-level things that there are in the operating system? Something um, which nobody ever um, will interface with directly, um, at least if you're not if you're a normal, normal um, user or anything like that. The reason for that is actually that I believe, um, yeah, one of the big, big benefits of Linux and of open source in general is that it is useful for everybody to educate himself. Because the sources are open, everybody can just go. Take the Linux sources, take um, the sources of any of our component of our stack, look at them, and um, actually figure out what's going on and improve it. So, um, ah, you can <laughs> okay. Um, so the question is, um, uh, um, so that's one of the big, big benefits. But um, what always, in my eyes, had been a bit of a of a problem with that is that the lower levels of our stack were actually not as, as accessible as they as they could be. Um, in Linux, we, we sometimes have this bit of an elitism. Um, most of the hackers who started Linux and are currently involved in Linux always, um, they, are, they are people who understand computers. After all, they've read Linux. Um, and they um, have this tendency to primarily scratch their own itches. So this, this had this effect that um, sometimes in Linux, uh, people actually strive from the complexity. They, like, like they find it cool if things are complex and they are the in crowd and the others not. So um, with uh, what we are trying, um, what we are trying to do with systemd, is kind of remove these boundaries a little bit. Um, of course, it's still low-level technology; it's still complex technology, and nothing's going to change about that. But um, I don't think that um, there's necessarily the need to make everything um, as complex as possible. I mean, in general, I mean, you often see this tendency of, of people running the most exotic window managers and things like that. I guess that is, in a way. Um, Another a reflection of the fact that people like to, to um, um, are keen on this kind of elitism, where they, they say, yes, I'm good. I want to use um, something that nobody else uses that, that only I can understand. But um, yeah, I don't know. The thing is, in general, I'm a, I'm a low-level systems guy. And I think the stuff that we are doing should be much more accessible. And that is, um, that is one of the, 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 the big driving forces, I guess that, that um, I have. I mean, there are many driving forces for many people, and there are di um, different ways how you can make uh, Linux accessible for other people. But given that I'm a low-level systems guy, I would say, yeah, the way I can, can uh, bring Linux forward and, and into the hands of people is by making those level, level things a um, little bit uh, more accessible to people. Now, um, yeah, the, the, the big thing about free software is, after all, um, that it levels the playing field. Um, there has never been any any movement like that where where um, let's say third world uh, third world um, um, developing countries um, get access to modern technology like with free software. I mean, um, it used to be that that anything that was um, developed new happened in the Western world in Japan, and everybody else um, kind of was left out in in the cold, and um, because there was relatively little. Um, movement of knowledge towards um, third world countries, they have a, very, have a very, very hard time to catch up. With free software, like never before, um, we actually give the technology free. And anybody on the internet, regardless where he resides, can actually get it and figure out what's going on. There's still, of course, a little bit of a, of a um, like in the Western world, people um, tend to be educated better. So they, they actually have a much, much easier way into actually getting the souls and actually understanding them. Um, so to actually level the playing field and giving everybody the same chance, I think it is, is um, really necessary. I guess I should turn up my own phone. It's kind of, I mean, usually it's somebody from the audience who had his phone on. So, sorry for that. Um, so like never before, um, um, free software gives the opportunity that we actually can layer, level the playing field and give everybody the, the, the same chance to actually play up with us and join our community and improve Linux in itself. So, um, um, looking at all, all of this, um, um, I climbed a lot, a lot of, of things here. Um, that basically, that, that, that Linux was complex and uh, these things. Now, you wonder, um, how do I 
actually come to these um, claims. I mean, uh, this is not. I mean, if you if you have been in Linux all your life, that's probably not not the the realization you made. Um, because I mean, you always use Linux probably, and, and and you know your way around. You know a lot of people who use Linux. But the thing is, if we look at the numbers, um, so where is Linux actually currently the market? Yeah. Um, where is Linux on the server? You probably would say we have a really really good position on the server. Basically. I mean, half the internet runs on Linux, probably more. Um, um, all companies in the world, basically, nowadays have Linux servers. But the question is, um, we, how, how did it actually get there? And um, is it actually really that good looking? Because if you look at the actual details, and you'll figure out that what Linux actually did for most of its um, lifetime is cannibalize um, the Unix um, server share that existed before. So um, Unix, like non-Linux Unix, kind of vanished from the view. But uh, if you look at the numbers over the years, you will notice that actually Windows um, servers kind of always kept the same um, market share in Reddit. Um, so you wonder, OK, now Linux got all the market share from Unix and stuff like that, and we got a 50% or something of the market. But what about the rest? And, and, and why don't the, the other administrators that are uh, left over there, why don't they come uh, up to our side? And um, there might be, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. I mean, people know that, um, that uh, for example, Windows, like Microsoft, actually pays you know, big web companies to, to offer Windows. But um, of these many um, uh, answers to that question, I'm focusing on, I, I, I'd focus on one specifically, which is that I actually believe the reason why a lot of people um, use Windows on the server is simply because uh, Linux actually still is complicated. So Windows does have a lower, lower um, um, entry point into understanding it. Now, the answer um, um, to that problem is probably to make it easier. Now, making things easier to use for many different methods, since I'm mostly low level. Um, could of course say, um, yeah, Windows has these nice um, um, powerful UIs where you can actually configure things with the UI rather than the command line. Um, that may be as it will. The thing is, um, I'm mostly a low-level guy. So I think, um, I, I don't even necessarily think that people really exist on the UI, but I think the, the command line of it, um, or the, the, the non-UI bits, should be relatively easy to, to, to discover and be easy to understand on that is probably something that can give us an edge. Now, if we, if we um, look on the other side of the, of the metal, where is Linux actually on the desktop? You will notice that, um, well, it's more or less actually not there. I mean, the, the, I mean Windows still has um, like 70, 80 um, percent of the market, and Mac OS still has a bigger um, market than, than uh, Linux has. And the question is, I mean, Ubuntu made it a big um, strike forward, but it's still um, way less than 10 percent. And the question is, um, why is that so? And I also think um, it's because Linux is really, really hard. And really, isn't, uh, Linux is not necessarily hard in, in, to use for, for end users these days anymore. But it is extremely hard to develop for Linux. So um, anyway, the question is, if we look at the server and at the desktop market, what we figure out is, yeah, Linux is really difficult. And that is why we never make the final step on the server side to actually attack Windows. And that's why we have a real um, hard time on doing on the desktop side getting anything, any foot at all into the market. So um, yeah, my vision for Linux, of course, is that we deal with these problems. That we actually um, manage to, to, to even attack Windows, the Windows the server market and the desktop market anyway in a big scale. And for me, that basically means um, helping turning Linux into something that you can easily discover and understand on the lower level, and turning Linux into something that, that actually is easy to work with, that is easy to develop for. Now, of course, um, this talk was supposed to be about vision and technology. And as mentioned, I'm mostly a technology guy. So um, most of the rest, I will focus on, on what that actually technically means for me. Um, what I think where the road should go. Um, of course, I'm a systemd guy, so um, what I'm mostly talking about is stuff that is related very closely <coughs> to systemd. But I hope it gives a li little bit of vision 
of uh, where we want to, to take system B in the next um, year or so. Um, usually my talks um, focus almost exclusively on the stuff that we already did. So this is actually going to be a talk about stuff that we're going to do. Um, um, yeah, I hope I'm not um, going to, to give too many promises about what we're going to do. Um, but yeah. So, as mentioned, Linux is hard. And that's what we want to do something about it. So, of course, um, you may say, is it really that hard? Um, I mean, there's so much documentation around. Um, there, there have been, basically since Linux was created, there has been this project of the Linux documentation project, which created how to some these kind of things. So, um, one way to attack um, problems that are hard is to document, document, document. But we have one fundamental problem. People don't actually read documentation that much. Some people do, and it's definitely part of the solution. But ultimately, people don't actually check that. So, um, you can make the best documentation in the world. And we try really hard with Systemd, for example, to provide a lot of documentation. Um, Systemd is probably one of the better documented um, uh, projects in the, in, the, in the free software world at all. Like we, have a, we have basically man pages for almost every interface that we have in, in Systemd. And we have regular blog articles that you might have seen that give an overview and, and, and certain features <coughs> um, every other month or so. Um, but the fundamental question is, is documentation actually enough? If I, if I listen to the community, um, I mean, some people actually uh, nowadays complain, oh my god, um, system must be so complex because it needs so much documentation. So um, it's probably even a, a problem that you can't really solve. If you have too little, people will say, it doesn't have any documentation, it sucks. And um, if you have um, more documentation, they will eventually say, oh my god, it must be so complex if it needs that much documentation. Um, anyway, I think there's no way around. We need documentation. But how do we solve the problem? that people actually never read them, or many people don't. And how do we push people towards actually reading them? So what we try, uh, tried with Systemd is to make the system more transparent. And that, um, more specifically, can mean that, uh, yeah, we actually link the documentation to the tools. Um, for example, in, in Systemd, um, Systemd, as mentioned, um, is this thing that helps you to boot up uh, your system. It uh, consists of a number of uh, components um, that, that are linked together and then started at boot. And um, what we did with Systemd is basically the documentation is connected directly to the vari various components of the system. So there's a first um, class command system control help um, that will, um, you can just invoke system control help on any component of the, of the boot process and it will actually start your man page which explains you in detail what's actually going on. It will um, give you basically a hint on what is it and how do you configure it. Um, this command is not, I mean, having just a command that nobody knows that exists is also, I mean, it's kind of useless. So um, um, we even made this uh, um, more in the face of the administrator, basically, by um, doing, if the, one of the most used commands basically in, in, in systemd, like if you, if you made the first step into systemd, you will realize that the most used command is system control status probably. System control status gives you the status of a component of the system. For example, if you want to know what Apache is doing, you can invoke system control status. Apache and will tell you, yeah, Apache is running, and uh, this is the last lock line, that kind of things. So um, to this system control status output, whatever component you, you invoke it on a system D, you will get the links to, to the documentation included. So um, yeah, this is one very, very easy, very superficial way how you can, can, can hopefully make the, 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 the system more introspect introspectable. And if people actually try to look at this thing and say, oh my god, I'm lost, I have no idea what this is, that's where you can get the documentation. They just have to click on it, basically, and a man browser opens and you can see it. But of course, that's just one facet. What else can we do um, to actually make the system more, more easy to understand and um, more easy to, to dissect for the interested um, uh, administrator. That is, um, we make everything introspectable. Everything introspectable means um, that uh, we generate logs from every bit of the system. That we collect those logs at the very same time so that the user can see them always. Um, more specifically, in, in, in the systemd context, we created something that's a journal. There's actually going to be a talk tomorrow that I'll do about the journal. Um, the journal is basically reinvention about, um, uh, of, of a logging system for Unix. 
Um, the, the journal's um, goal is basically concentrate everything that we have in Linux to index it and to make it available to show at the right spots. For example, the system control status command that I already mentioned that will, will give you a lot of information about um, the various components of the boot is closely integrated with the journal and will actually show you the last log lines of the, of the um, component in question. So if you wanted to know what the fuck is this Apache thing um, and you could type system control status, then it will actually show you those log lines. Now, with the journal, we actually um, um, hooked up everything right from the beginning of the boot process. So you got the messages from the kernel, you got the messages from the initial RAM disk, if you know what that is. Um, you get it from early boot, and you get it from late boot, and you get it from the main system runtime. In previous solutions with, with all kind of logging, this basically just covered the last bit that I, the, the, the main runtime. Now, having these logs around um, um, is already a big step forward, because currently there are no, no uh, white gaps anymore in things. You suddenly have at one spot everything that happened in the system. But um, yeah, if you, if you look at logs currently, how they have been collected in syslog and in valloc messages, for example, you will realize that those messages are usually in English language and are fairly technical. Again, what, what kind of drives me is getting stuff into the pe people, hands of people and, and giving people the chance to easily understand things. If you do everything very technically in a very low level language and do everything in English, you will only um, reach so much um, like a, a certain level of the, of the uh, um, uh, population or of the administrator population. So um, what do we do to actually make those logs more accessible? Um, here's something that we're going to do with systemd. Actually, I mostly have my, the code for that already on my laptop. Um, we try to make logs more explanatory. Um, and that basically means um, we need to kind of, I mean, this has been an old age problem. What do you do about the translation of logs? Of course, um, there have been a couple of um, suggestions how we should translate logs, like a couple of people actually interna added internationalization to the to system services themselves. Most people would, would, say, would probably say, oh my god, this is a low-level system service. I'm not sure it actually should do translation and, and, and hook into the localization frameworks. Um, I tend to be of the same uh, kind. But somehow we need to give the people the ability that if they see a weird um, error message that they cannot make any sense of, that they find the documentation that they, um, or the translation and documentation of, of what it means. So with a, with a journal, what specifically we wanted to do is add the ability to um, identify error messages and look at translations and further documentation somewhere um, related to it. Um, in the journal, you can actually attach a short identifier to each um, message you, you write. If you do that, then this identifier can implicitly be used to actually look up documentation for it. So um, if you actually look at the logs now, we can actually um, explain to you every log, or not every one, um, of course, not it, and especially not in the beginning. But we can actually explain to you and, and like add a little bit of an explanation block next to each line that you can click on, and then we'll show up, and then we'll give you a couple of details. So um, let's just look a little bit at an example for this. Um, you know you had a disk failure. And uh, disk failure messages are usually hard to understand because it says something like, like I.O. error um, on sector so-and-so on disk um, HDD so-and-so and so-and-so. Um, that's not the most, I mean, you need to know what a sector is and you need to know what an HDD is and these kind of things. And it's, it's completely English. So the idea is this type of message, sector bad, um, will get an ID. And on display, we can look up um, a little bit of an explanatory text by this ID, where you find um, an internationalized um, short text that tells you, OK, this means that your hard disk is broken, and you probably should go to the shop buy a new one and replace it like this. And it will do that in, the, in your local language. So um, yeah, we try to, to, to solve the problem with this both internationalization problem and the problem that messages are hard to understand. And all that's necessary for that is um, basically that, that uh, when, when people log something and the log message actually matters, they should attach a short ID to it and, um, so that the documentation can be linked up somewhere else. So that's another idea. Of course, um, it's going to be a steep um, um, approach to actually make this, this, this ubiquitous. Um, but uh, for example, for systemd itself, which generates a lot of messages, um, like I don't know if a service fails and these kind of things, um, we of course can bring this up to speed right away. Of course, third-party demos will take a little bit longer. Um, 
So yeah, um, these are a couple, couple of things like on the, that we can do in the lower level, like um, make everything introspectable, um, explain everything as good as we can, and uh, close the white gaps where people don't understand things. Now, this is the, basically what I'm talking about here is probably something that will um, make things more explanatory to people who, are, who basically come from nothing, come from Windows or something like that. Um, what is still a problem, of course, is um, a classic Unix administrators. Um, probably, if they if they play around nowadays with system D, they will figure out, oh my god, it's completely different from what I used to before. I personally don't believe it's it's uh, um, so extremely different. Um, but um, the, the general takeaway, I think, is what is what helps making things easier to understand for normal people will also make things uh, um, easier to understand for for Unix administrators. And um, so much, uh, for example, there's this little um, feature of uh, showing uh, documentation of uh, services next to the service status. I think everybody will benefit from that. So, um, yeah, this is, this is one uh, side of the things that I was talking uh, about. Like, like a couple of, of ideas how we can make the server side of things more accessible to people. And um, uh, yeah, kind of try to close um, the gap toward Windows in this area. Of course, there's never the, the going to be the entire story. We do need probably UIs to make things more configurable, but that's not so much my area of work. This is I'm I'm focusing on the low-level stuff. So this is what I think should happen on our side. Now, let's change gears. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, I, I I pointed out the fact that Linux on the desktop is still basically non-existent, and uh, yeah, the question is why is that so? And uh, there are of course many many reasons for that. Like there's again the problem that we never get a foot in the market, and, and as long as nobody writes apps, nobody's going to use it, and as nobody, as long as nobody's going to use it, nobody's going to write apps. Um, uh, and there are many other uh, um, issues with it because people already have enough of these uh, um, uh, of operating systems. So why do they then Linux and, and whatnot and whatnot? I would like to focus on one specific problem, the problem that I can tackle again, or that I'm trying, uh, I can try to tackle again. And um, yeah, the, the, the one issue that I see, that the, it's probably one of the biggest issues that I see with the Linux desktop, is that our app store is absolutely horrible. Um, if, uh, I think if we, if we want uh, people to use our stuff, we need to have a better app store. We need um, actually people writing applications in a much bigger way than they currently do. Currently, almost all of the apps we have on Linux are free software apps that are developed like Linux is the same way. It turns out, however, that um, it for, for a platform to be truly, truly um, successful, we probably need all kinds of apps, not just the free software kind of apps that are developed along with Linux. Um, so, um, yeah, the question is, so why is it so awful? Um, why do I say that it is absolutely horrible? Um, let's, uh, let's focus a little bit how apps currently work on Linux. Uh, currently on Linux, the, the primary way how you get your stuff, how you get your applications, how you get your Firefox, how you get your whatever um, else you need, your, your GIMP um, or your Emacs even, is um, via the distribution. The distribution on Linux is everything. Um, it is the kind of only pass onto your system for software, in most cases, um, that exists. And that is fantastic. That has uh, a lot of benefits. That has a big benefit, basically, that a distribution is always there and can reuse the source code. And um, so basically, I mean, they, you're trusting your data to the software. And it's kind of good if, if somebody looks at that stuff and uh, makes sure that it actually does what it says it does and doesn't just send all your personal data to the internet to some, some um, bad server and, and that people sell on eBay later on. So distributions have. Um, I mean, they have uh, many, many um, benefits, but, but they have this security benefit that you actually, if you can trust this, the, as long as you trust the distribution um, and the distribution verifies everything, you're kind of on the safe side of things. But um, yeah, the question is if it's actually really that bad, uh, that good. Um, having everything being uh, um, pushed through the distribution kind of results in that third-party apps don't really work. Um, third-party apps are, are a security nightmare because nobody reviews their software. And uh, so if you, if you download something from a, from a third-party vendor, 
You basically have to trust him. You give him full access to your computer. Um, but uh, even more so from the, from the perspective of the actual vendor of the third party software, um, writing third party software for Linux is extremely hard. It's hard to develop, it's hard to build, and it's hard to ship. So um, this, is, this is all not an issue for, 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 for our distributions because if the distributions have a huge infrastructure to uh, build everything and to ship everything. They have apt-get, they have uh, build systems, they have uh, all kinds of uh, architectures around like operating system versions and, and different CPUs and these kind of things. They have no problem at all at uh, um, yeah, compiling everything and giving things into the hand of users. But for third party people, for other people, that doesn't really work. Um, so, um, uh, more specifically, um, apps don't have a sandbox. So, um, you have this problem that if you inst install, as mentioned, um, software from somebody else, um, it has full access to your computer, basically. Or, well, it, it probably doesn't have full access to your computer because we have um, like, like user IDs and things in Unix, but it does has, have full control of your home directory which ultimately is where all your private data is and where all this stuff is that should actually be protected um, from third-party code. Um, from the vendor perspective, we have a thousand of different interfaces, libraries. We have a thousand of different combinations of different libraries. Um, we have a, a, a thousand of different versions of that. We have a thousand, well, okay, probably not a thousand packaging formats, but we have at least um, um, three different packaging formats. We have 10 architectures or so. All of this putting that together, explodes the test matrix. The test matrix is basically, um, if you're a third party developer, you develop your code, and you need to get it uh, into the hands of people, and uh, before you do that, you usually add a little bit of testing. But uh, the thing is, um, how do you test? You basically build up an environment and uh, have somebody clicking on buttons and um, doing what else um, you want to do for tests. But uh, building that environment kind of requires that you actually have an environment to test against. The thing is, with how this currently works, with this complete mix and match of versions, interfaces, combinations, packaging formats, and architectures, you kind of have, a, have a, um, a combinatory problem that the test matrix is completely exploded. Because um, basically, a third party vendor has no way to test your software against all of these um, different versions. So, um, given that um, uh, this is a particular problem for, for distributions or with distributions that kind of move to this, this more rolling uh, model of uh, updates. Like, I mean, I guess m most people who run Debian probably don't run a, a really stable version of Debian, but constantly update things. The net result is that because they update these libraries, and um, from that point in time, then they updated the other ones, and then they updated this. On their system, they basically always have a different set of combination of interfaces in different versions. And um, as a third party software vendor, it's completely impossible to test against that. Um, so, the fact of that is, um, I know for, for a fact, for example, that there are quite a few companies nowadays, for example, in the, in, the, in the music business, that actually do develop all their stuff on Linux because it's so awesome, because you have so much um, um, debugging tools and you can actually look at the lower levels of the stack, and then ultimately port it to Windows, but never actually give um, um, the Linux code, um, ne never actually open up the Linux code or, or, or give or sell Linux versions of their code, even though they always develop everything on that. And, um, it did, did it on that in, in the first place. And that is simply and primarily because they can't test it. And if they can't test it, they could, of course, still um, give it to people, but then they would have to deal with all the support issues. So, um, yeah. It is, a, it is a huge problem that uh, you can't retest this. So, um, there, have, uh, of course, have been earlier attempts to fix this problem. There has been the LSB, the Linux standard base. <coughs> LSB basically looked at this issue and said, oh my god, we have so many different uh, libraries, so many different versions, so many, many different distributions that all package it slightly differently, have different bugs, uh, bug fixes applied, and um, these kind of things. So let's standardize this and uh, have everybody adopt the LSB, and then everybody can just hack against the LSB and everything will be w working. The thing is, um, what LSB ultimately did is they looked at a couple of libraries, like they looked at libason and glibc and, <coughs> and GDK and uh, uh, libscdc++ and these kind of things, and uh, wrote down a document. This is how it looks. Um, what's the success of LSB? 
Honestly, I don't think that there's any success at all. Nobody ships software in the LSB format. I mean, does anybody if you know any software that is shipped in, in the LSB packaging format? Nobody, right? I mean, they, they, they created a packaging format based on RPM that has a suffix LSB. I don't think anybody of you ever saw a package in the wild with the LSB suffix. Nobody did that. So um, in a way, I think it's a, it's a complete failure. Um, because um, the thing is, it didn't really solve the problem. It tried to standardize things, and a couple of distributions um, um, dealt with it, but it doesn't save the test really fix the testability problem. Sure, now you can uh, develop your software against uh, the same interfaces and have a decent chance that, that the same interface is available in all the various distributions. But still, you can't test this stuff because the distribution still will have different versions um, running and di different um, bug fixes applied and different, slightly different paths and stuff, things like that. So, um, yeah, LSB didn't really solve much. Um, nice try, but uh, sorry. Um, then uh, another try is the Ubuntu App Store. The U Ubuntu App Store is a very recent thing. Um, if you look at, the, at, at, at what they're trying to do is um, they use the classic ways to ship software in Linux, which is um, Debian packages in that case, and uh, just want uh, third-party developers to, to package their stuff as in, in that format. Of course, they realized the, the testing problem, I think. I mean, I, I, I don't know, actually. I mean, they, they don't really talk too much to us, so I, don't, I can only guess about the actual thinking behind that. But so they figured out that the problem was, um, too, that people can't develop stuff for Linux and test it and ship it and get in all the combinations, right? So what they said, yeah, Ubuntu is the only thing that matters. So you build only your stuff for Ubuntu. And they actually have the service where you can actually give the software to, to Economical, and they'll build it for you and make packages out of it. And that's how they then fix the security issue, because Canonical actually looked at the code, and then you can trust it. Um, interesting idea. I think it leaves uh, most of the free software community out of, out of uh, like, in a, in, a, in a bad spot, because, yeah, the Ubuntu app store is the Ubuntu app store, and, and it doesn't really work on anything else. And for third-party developers, of course, it's kind of weird giving your software to Canonical so that they can review it and package it. And um, yeah, it's probably not what, what uh, many third-party developers want to do. So sure, it's probably going to be um, successful in a way. Um, ultimately, I don't think it's, it's, it's actually serving the real issue because um, yeah, if you, you probably should fix a security problem um, with a security solution, is my um, opinion. Then another uh, approach to solving these issues is library bundling. This is, for example, something that, that Firefox is trying to do. If you download a Firefox release from, from the Firefox service instead of from your distribution servers, you'll ultimately find that um, they'll um, bundle a lot of dependencies along with Firefox. So that if you install Firefox, basically they share very, very little with your host system. Like they share basically glibc and, and the kernel, but they will not share GTK and they will not share anything else. That is their way to deal with the testing issue because um, they just say, okay, we tested it against GTK so and so, and uh, with these bug fixes applied, and uh, because we can't test it against anything else and we don't want to have this explode test metrics, that's all we're, what we're going to do. And uh, to deal with the problem, we'll just ship it along. This is, of course, hated very much by many distributions, including Debian is very loud about it. Debian doesn't allow like, packages which ship their own bundling libraries in the um, distribution, neither does Fedora. And they probably have a point in doing that because it's a different packaging model. It's, uh, it shouldn't be in the distribution because this is basically for third-party download stuff. Of course, library bundling is, a, is an ad hoc solution. It's a workaround. It's um, something that is not standardized, and that has serious issues. The serious issue number one is, of course, it's still a security problem. Because if people bundle the libraries, um, they'll pick one version that they have tested their stuff against and include it in the, in the, in the app bundle thing. But uh, if that library tends to have bugs, and all software tends to have bugs, uh, um, it will never be updated unless you updated the, the, the actual package itself, which is one of the main reasons why people actually like distributions, because if, if there's a problem in, um, I don't know, OpenSSL, then OpenSSL gets updated. But uh, if you li uh, bundle the library, then you pr probably will have a couple of versions of uh, OpenSSL around. And uh, uh, so you would have to update every single one of them, but that's hard because it's all bundled, and you have 10 versions of it. So um, yeah, these, are, these have been attempts to fix these problems. I don't think any, any of these, uh, um, solutions, uh, these, these attempts actually really fixed the issue. Now, um, 
Yeah, I, I generally believe um, we should fix it and should fix it properly. So um, let's do it. We need isolated sandboxed apps. We need um, to fix the security issues. We need to fix the uh, stability of interface issues. We need to fix the test metric issues. We need to fix the packaging format issues. We need to fix the issues with that we have so many architectures that things run on. And um, yeah, um, if, we, if we have isolated sandboxed apps, then uh, this solves a couple of things. If we have a sandboxed app, then um, you kind of solve the problem that there is no distribution anymore in the way that can review the code before it um, ends up on your, on your system. Because, well, it runs in a sandbox. It can't do uh, more than it should be doing. Um, it already also solves the problem with bundling libraries. Because if, if uh, a library is uh, bundled but, and, and broken and has a bug fix in it and, and, and it's not fixed, it runs in a sandbox. So what it can do is rather limited. So, um, of course, in Linux, we don't have currently any solution that would allow us to um, do sandbox apps nicely. I mean, probably think people think about SLinux and AppArm and these kind of things. But um, I think they're fundamentally flawed in this uh, area because, especially as a Linux, the way you, the, the, the policy is written, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys all know as a Linux. As a Linux is basically a huge security framework that is being pushed by Red Hat and the NSA and a couple of other um, big shots into, into Linux. It basically lists for all the, all the applications, all the server-side stuff that you're running, what a specific binary can do. So it basically is a list of, you can access that file and you can access that device, but you can't do this and this and this. So um, the, the way SLinux policy files are written, however, are that only the vendor of the distribution can write them. And that is fundamentally incompatible with a third party app problem where we kind of want to remove the, the, the distribution as a single point, uh, like centralizing point where everything goes through. So let's uh, figure out how do we do it instead. Now, um, Linux is, is nowadays a quite advanced kernel. And it has a lot of features that will get us quite far, actually. We nowadays have uh, namespaces in Linux. Um, namespaces basically allow you to, to um, create a little virtualized system inside of your system. Um, more, most interesting of these namespaces are a part called file system namespaces, which basically allows you to give, give a, a process and, or a number of processes that you run a different view on the file system than a, anything else that runs. So if the, the host runs in, 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 on a, in, a, in a root directory um, from one hard disk, then you can run individual processes with a root directory of a subtree of that. And this, this application will not be able to see anything outside of that file system namespace. And um, because it can't see it, it can't access it, and can't modify it. So um, these namespaces have been around for quite a while. The, the original intent with these namespaces um, was to enable container solutions, because it basically allows you to run um, 10 operating systems on a single kernel, because every system you can boot up basically just gets a subdirectory of the main tree. Now, we can make use of this for for apps, because we can actually say, well, um, these namespaces are super flexible. So I, we can set up an environment where I can execute an, an app, let's say Firefox, and it will get access to these and these and these and these files, but it won't get access and won't even see them and it won't even know that they are there to everything else. So um, that's quite interesting already, because what it allows us to do is to select specific files from the host or specific directories from the host, make those visible to the app, and hide everything else. Um, the files we make visible, for example, could be libraries that we consider so stable that people don't have an test matrix issue with them, um, and directories that, that, that follow um, certain guidelines. So basically, um, you can, can, can hide away the the, the the, the problems of the lower level operating system, and you can make sure that if um, your app is an evil app, it can't modify anything that it shouldn't modify. We have more stuff like that. We have control groups. Control groups um, is something the system heavily relies on. It's, uh, it's a way how you can group process on the system and apply um, constraints to it. And the constraints is primarily focused on resources so that you can make sure that the app cannot take uh, more memory than it should. 
and, uh, but it can also mean a couple of security related issues. So these control groups and namespaces together already allow us to, to limit what an app can do on the file system and what an app can do um, with your system resources. But we have more than that. Something very recently added to the Linux kernel is SecComp filters. Um, SecComp is a, a short for Secure Computing. It is something that, um, like the patch comes from the Google folks, but they, what they basically wanted to do is, um, in the Chrome browser, they wanted to run the JavaScript engine in an environment that is highly secure, that is highly sandboxed. Now, the face is that the process and its children can access. Now, if uh, Chrome can use that for JavaScript, we can totally use that for native applications as well. So, what else do we have? We have loopback devices. Loopback devices basically allow us to take a file and uh, put a file system on it and hook it into the normal file system hierarchy. And we have compressed file systems. Compressed file systems, more specifically SquashFS and such like, um, basically allow us to have a complete file system that you can mount, but they're actually compressed. Now, if we put all this together, we kind of have something that we can build an app environment of. Because we can actually um, limit what the app can do. We can sandbox it, um, make sure that it can't access resources and, 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 and uh, file system stuff, and uh, can't do um, a call any system call it wants. And we can put this app inside of a, of a compressed file system on a loopback device so that we have a single file that we can uh, just put somewhere, and then uh, we can uh, mount it, and then we can execute it in this sandbox environment. And at that point in time, we know that the app is, is, is limited in what it can do. And uh, we can terminate at any time. And it's going to be one single file. So um, yeah, of course, um, by the way, if, if anybody of you has questions, um, just go and interrupt me. Um, I mean, we, we can have uh, questions later on, but uh, I always prefer if you guys interrupt me, in case I'm getting too far. Um, but anyway, so, so listing all of this, now, we have these technologies that we can actually build apps from, I believe. Um, if, you, if you look at this closer, you will notice that in systemd, for system services, we actually expose a lot of this sh um, stuff already. For systemd system services, like for example for Apache, you can already use namespaces to hide certain things um, in the directory tree or um, uh, give a, a service a special view on the file system. Uh, we do this for security um, considerations. For, uh, an example for this is, for example, you want to run Apache, but n you don't want to give Apache um, control to, I don't know, your, your etc password, with pep password file. So what you can do actually is can, can just set up a namespace and, and limit that. And there are actually a couple of hosters uh, nowadays who use um, um, this feature of system, you know. And you can just write down in the service file the stuff that Apache can access and can't. Um, and systemd also, as mentioned, heavily relies on control groups. Um, it does this primarily to just keep track of services, but um, systemd can actually do the resource stuff as well. We are also exposed in systemd second filters, which is also security technology to, to limit what um, system services can do, so, um, uh, which can be used to limit, for example, what Apache can do. Um, so you basically can say, yeah, Apache can have access to sockets and, and do all kind of network stuff, but a Apache should not be able to reboot the machine, for example. That's something you can express easily with second filters. Um, we, uh, in the context of systemd, we also f um, fix the loopback devices in the kernel. And um, um, yeah, the compressed file system is nothing that the systemd currently makes use of. But anyway, the, the, the harder parts are probably the first three, actually. And we have that code in systemd. So to be m actually, what we want to do in the, in the next year is actually add a little bit of an, an app executor to, to systemd. Because we have most of the code in there. And what we can do for system services, we just have to, to, to combine a little bit differently. And then we can do for user-based apps as well. Now, there are a couple of issues um, on the way to fix this. I mean, we have been thinking about this for, for half a year or so and, and, and try to figure out like, where are the limitations of that. And that's, there, there are going to be a couple of walls we'll run into. And um, at least initially, the, the sandbox is not going to be entirely secure. Um, I mean, nothing is entirely secure. But um, we already know that the sandbox will have holes in it. For example, um, if you actually want to run an app in a namespace, not everything is a file system. There's, there's, there's network protocols. Like, you need to deal with, with X11. And you need to give an app, of course, access to X11 so that it can actually show 
um, yeah, like if you, if, you, if you run Firefox in a sandbox, um, Firefox still needs to be able to access your, your graphics card by X11. And X11 is a protocol that, is, that has holes like, like Swiss cheese. And by making, uh, giving the app access to, to uh, X11, yeah, basically you have a huge hole in your stuff. But um, the thing is, uh, we need to get the ball rolling. If you look in the, in, the, in the bigger perspective, all the other operating systems nowadays have good sandboxing solutions. Um, on MacOS, you have with the most recent uh, MacOS version um, the, 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 the stuff that you have for the MacOS market. It requires all apps to run a sandbox. Android had that from, from day one, basically. They, they implemented sandboxes as, uh, on the Linux kernel by using user IDs. That is nothing we can do in the, in the broader Linux because user IDs on Linux actually have the meaning of being user IDs instead of app IDs. Um, uh, on, on Windows, on, on Windows, uh, the new version, what they call again? Um, yeah, on Windows, this, this Metro thing um, uh, also has an app sandbox, uh, which basically says, yeah, yeah, if you, if you ship in a Metro app and you want to put it in the, in the Windows Marketplace thingy, then it has to run in a very secure down um, thing. So you have all the other operating systems have these sandboxes, and they have them for the very same reasons that I pointed out testability, security issues, and so on and so on. So we need that too. Um, and I think it should live in system E because we already have all the low level stuff and we can contest these things up. Um, I got 10 minutes left. Um, well, this is a little bit of an esoteric thing to talk about, but I can talk about it if nobody has questions. But um, we probably should do questions now. So anyone has a question? <coughs> There's a question. Um, how do we do this with the mics, by the way? Should we? Should I just go there? Ah. I understand from a user perspective why I want this. But imagine I'm canonical. I'm still figuring out how to make money. Why would I want to endorse this in any way, shape, or form? Um, so the canonical question in, in general is, um, well, I'm not working for canonical, I'm working for Red Hat. So what we try to do is we, we try to solve this thing for everybody, not just for, for Ubuntu. Um, I think canonical, they, they, they found their own solution. It's, it's called the Ubuntu um, 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 App Store. I think it has serious drawbacks because it doesn't solve any of the real issues with the sandboxing and these kind of things. Um, it's good for them. I don't know. Um, I think they should invest more in engineering and solve, solve the problems properly. I will try to, to fix them properly. That's, that's what I can do. Um, of course, uh, there's a money incentive behind it, absolutely. I mean, if you put it out here on, on, on App Store, you can make a ton of money. I mean, a lot of, of the money that Apple makes is out of the App Store. Of course, the Linux App Store is initially not going to be the most um, a money the, like a huge money-making machine, but ultimately, this is what people need. And um, I mean, I think they're, they're, they're of course, it's Linux. Linux is different from, from other operating systems. We don't have monopolies like the, the Apple uh, App Store or the Android App Store. And we don't want these uh, uh, monopolies. So we probably will end up with something where, where many app, app stores exist and you can actually choose from, from, from different ones. Um, so with the solution that I'm proposing, basically, um, I mean, I will not fix the App Store issue anyway. I'm not a web programmer who can, can hack an uh, uh, App Store that much. But um, what I can do is I can fix the, 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 the on-site issue, like basically uh, define an app form and, and um, define the sandbox and run things in it. So um, I don't know. The thing is, um, of course, um, there are not many companies making uh, money out of the Linux desktop. I don't think even uh, canonical. But I think they could if, if we would f fix actually the issues. And I'm here for fixing the issues, and other people can just make the money out of it or something like that. They should just give me a little bit of it, but yeah. Anyway, any, any other questions? I hope that kind of answered your question. Uh, when you have uh, sandbox applications and bundled libraries, uh, you lose much of the benefits of the shared libraries, like a memory footprint. Um, that is a valid uh, um, um, issue. We have approaches to deal with a little bit with that um, by um, we can deduplicate things. Like we can figure out that this library is actually the same as, as another one. And we can deal with this um, by saying, I mean, there are different kinds of apps. So there's, there's the apps that are regularly updated, like, for example, Firefox. The Firefox guys, um, um, I think they release a new version of Firefox every three months now or something like that. So, um, and there are apps that are basically written once and never updated. For, uh, games tend to be like that. 
So um, if, if a game um, a developer prepares his game, he will write it, and then eventually he will put it out there, and that's kind of the end of the story, and he will not regularly update it. So um, the first kind of app, apps, they probably can, uh, can deal with the platform changing more frequently. The latter kind of uh, um, the game developers um, don't want that. They want a very, very, very solid app so that they, if they write it once, it still runs in five years on that thing. So um, depending on what kind of app you have and how quickly they can update to, to newer interfaces, um, you, can, you can provide more access to the system libraries um, to the apps themselves. Firefox, for example, we could just say, yeah, Firefox, so we have this set of libraries. These we consider stable enough for the next three years. Now, when you do your app, you can choose this profile for your app, and we will make these um, libraries available to you. And then um, you do not lose the, 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 the shared issue, um, uh, uh, the shared problem, because basically, yeah, everything that's in this profile that is stable for three years will be shared by the host and, and the, the apps, because it comes from the host and will be available to the apps. Um, on the other hand, um, if you, a games developer who wants to have everything work for at least 10 years, um, you can tell him, okay, only these few libraries, which is probably going to be Glipsy and little else, they are going to be stable for 10 years. So we, you mount these, you make these available in the sandbox and can share them with the host, but nothing else. So um, it's basically, the answer to that is, depending on how stable app developers need the operating system to be, um, you can you need to have more duplication or less duplication. And um, if they, if they uh, require ultimate st stability, they need to ship more stuff in the app and you lose the sharing thing. And um, if they don't need that much, um, you, can, uh, um, you can share more from the host system and they can deal with the fact that it changes more frequently. So I hope that kind of answered your question. You, you mentioned the security uh, properties of the of the app, uh, but there's a lot about sharing. For instance, with Firefox, I want to be able to upload all my files, so it needs access to everything. Um, that is an absolutely valid point. Um, the, the sandboxing solutions of uh, Android and, and uh, Metro actually thought about these issues. Um, basically, um, you sometimes want an app to get access to certain things that are anywhere on the file system, and that is usually out of the view of the, of the app itself. There's a solution, um, let's, let's talk a little bit specifically about the Android solution to these problems. They created something called intents. Intents are basically a way how, it's like kind of the very, very few ways how an Android app can actually communicate with these things outside of the sandbox. It basically says there's an intent where it's a formalized little bit of a document that they send to the system and say, I need a file that uh, matches these cr criteria. For example, needs to be in an open office document or something like that. This is then sent to the, to the operating system. The operating system um, will then bring up a, a, a file chooser which runs outside of the sandbox in a different sandbox. Um, it has full access to the file system. You select a file there, and then um, the response to, to, to this file um, chooser request is passed back to the original application, including actually file descriptor to the original file, and then your app can access exactly that. In Android, this is actually really, really flexible in Android, because it's also how you get access to the camera. So instead of giving, giving your, ca uh, your app free access to the hardware device, what you do instead is you find an, an, an intent and say, I need to take a photo. And then what happens in Android is instead of that the file chooser app will be started and you choose a file, Instead, you will um, open the camera program, you take a camera, and then you return it to the application. So this is, a, this is actually really interesting because most people, if they read the Android documentation, think that, uh, that intents are inherently an integration feature, because it is. But actually, what's really interesting about it, it's a security feature, because it allows us to do the security transition. Um, and the user explicitly has always to say yes. It is always the user who selects the file to allow the, the application access to it. It is the user who presses the, 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 the camera button to actually take the photo and things like that. So, so something that, that appears to be an integration feature is actually a security feature, and that's how you solve these problems. Um, of course, we currently don't have any intent-like framework on Linux, but we need to solve it in that context. It's a, it's a UI issue. The KDE people need to think about it. The GNOME people need to think about it.
I think that was first. One short question regarding the memory and the duplication. Can system view when it creates a container subscribe to kernel same page merging? Um, so the kernel same page merging is, I, I think it's a relatively dumb thing. It just goes through the, all the memory and tries to deduplicate de things. So um, I don't think there's a need for systemd to, to actually do this. Um, so so to, to give a little bit of background, uh, um, same page merging is basically, if you have a lot of VMs around, um, like in a, in, a, in a big server setup, and all of them run the same operating systems inside, all of them run, run RHEL 5 or something like that, then you end up with a lot of times the same memory contents because they will all have the same glibc in memory, they will all have the same open SSL memory. So the, the virtualization people came up with something called um, kernel same page merging, where they basically, um, in, a, in a background thread, go through all the system memory and check if, if, if memory is equal, like if this page equals that page. And if it does so, um, they will free one and add a reference to the other, um, to, the, to the thing. So what is good for virtualization is also um, good for sandboxing apps. Because ultimately, I mean, we're using the container stuff here. Container stuff is virtualization. It's kind of the same problem. So I don't think there's actually need for, for hooking things into that. I'm not sure if, if KSM, I mean, I, I don't know what the, what the pressure of, of KSM is on, on, on power management kind of things because it always wakes up and goes through so memory and kind of thing and these things. But it's certainly something that might be an option. Well, I see it useful uh, in the case you found the libraries. Um, it might be, I don't know. The, the thing is like, uh, of course you have relocations in these kind of things, um, but uh, to be honest, I, I never measured it and I have no, no experience with it. It might, might be, but it's definitely a good idea to, to look into that if, it's, if it is useful. briefly mentioned the issue with SA Linux because it's the distributions that actually control what is being sandboxed and how they have control. In your new solution, who would have the control over a third party app as to what is accessible and what is not? That's a very good question. Um, if we look at the, at the Android solution of things, um, I think it's kind of flawed. So what Android does basically is if you install the app, it of course asks you, shall the app get access to this? Uh, of course, everybody knows that in the in the Android case, everybody just presses OK, and and it's a pointless security thing. I, I think um, it's it's probably a problem. We we need some kind of policies there where you actually the user makes this this um, decision that this is OK and this is not OK. Um, I think it's mostly UI problem, and I think the UI designer should deal with that. For example, I personally I think a good solution could be that you say um, you, you just add a traffic light to it, and a traffic light to it where green basically says. Um, yeah, it does only the really obvious stuff. It can get access to the internet, but not to your local network. It can get no access to your local files and can do a couple of other things, but that's it. Or you can say, as soon as it gets access to your local files, you add a yellow color to it. And if, you, if it gets access to your, your root account, then you put a red light to it. And then hopefully people will realize, okay, oh my god, this app has a red light to it. What's, what's, what's wrong? And then people will not actually want to write their stuff with that. But um, yeah, I think it's basically a presentation issue. We need to find a way to make this aware to the user that's a security problem. But I think I'm three minutes over time, so I probably should, should uh, end this now. So um, thank you very much for your interest. Uh, if you have any further questions, I'm going to be around. There's going to be this talk tomorrow about the journal that I'm going to give. Um, so come tomorrow, and uh, thank you very much.